this presentation, I want to review a few things about Lyme and the importance of not having too low pH to avoid uh, yield losses out there. And also, I will um, include near the end some new research, you know, recent research on uh, pelleted Lyme. Okay, we need to uh, remember what are the major causes of soil edification in the short term when we are talking in terms of years or 10 years, 20 years. Uh, the most important cause is the, the change of ammonium to nitrate from uh, ammonium containing nitrogen fertilizers or manure. This acidify because the transformation uh, releases hydrogen ions to the soil. So by pound of product, ammonium sulfate acidifies the most of all the sources, followed by MAP and DAP, and then a hydrous ammonia, urea, liquid soil manure, and UAN. But this is per, per pound, you see. Normally, the important the most important thing is the amounts of the, the fertilizer applied. So seldom there is too much nitrogen applied with ammonium sulfate. Um, uh, and the nitrogen applied with MAP and RAP is not that much, I mean, usually. Um, so the, um, the elemental sulfur, for example, acidifies because its oxidation by microorganisms to sulfate releases hydrogen ions. But normally, uh, there is a small amount applied to supply the sulfur needed by, by crops. So really, the acidification is not uh, significant at all. And then we need to remind uh, everybody that gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, does not change pH in non-sodic soils like we have in Iowa. In, in, in highly alkaline, sodium-affected soils like in the... In, in the in the Western Great Plains or the mountain states, um, when the soils have good drain, a gypsum, application of gypsum can reduce pH. Normally, a pH there can be 9, 10, because the sodium, the calcium exchanges with sodium and then favors the, the lichen from the soil, and that can, can reduce the pH. Uh, another thing important to remember is why lime or ag lime neutralizes soil acidity. See, uh, lime sources like ag lime, pellet lime, eggshells, and lime from water treatment plants increase soil pH because they have calcium or magnesium carbonates, mainly, okay? Uh, soil pH is also increased by uh, quick lime or burnt lime, uh, plant residue ash that have potassium, calcium, magnesium oxides, and hydrated lime. Now, these materials react with the hydrogens, with the acidity in the soil solution, and the reaction produces free calcium or magnesium uh, cations, water, and when the source are carbonates, uh, produce carbon dioxide gas, okay? So the key to increase pH is not the calcium or the magnesium but the partial elimination of hydrogen from the soil solution by producing water or both water and CO2. And again, uh, these reactions do not happen with gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, does not change pH, and other sources like uh, calcium chloride does not change pH either, okay? So we need to remember what is what actually has the, the acidity neutralization effect. Now, the third important thing to, to, to remind everybody, which most people know, but especially if uh, there is some, some listeners from, from other states, um, the acidity neutralizing value varies greatly across limey materials. Now, that is estimated by, by two things, by, by two measurements. One is calcium carbonate equivalent, which is, is measured by... Um, I mean, using a, a strong acid in, in the lab, and is the amount uh, or the, the neutralizing value compared to finely ground pure calcium carbonate. Now, this is uh, 
it's, it's almost the same everywhere, all, all over the northern, the, the, the north central region is the same uh, method. But the particle size distribution, the fineness of alignment material, affects the solubility in the soil and the time it takes to increase pH to, to a certain target. So here in Iowa, we call that, th that measurement effective calcium carbonate equivalent, okay? And this is done with a, a decades-old method that uh, uh, is required by IELTS for the um, uh, analysis of uh, any lime material that is sold in the state for queries, certification, and so forth. So it combines the CEC measurement and an estimate of the material effectiveness according to the proportion of particles of different fineness that are in the material. Um, the, the, in, in Iowa, the mesh sizes that are, uh, that are used are, are size 4, 8, and 60. Now, other states use these uh, same uh, screens, or uh, sometimes they use uh, others, like for example, I believe Wisconsin uses the, the 22, the 20 mesh size. Okay, in Iowa, there is a very long history of uh, Lyme research since the 40s until the 60s, and those were used to establish the ISU Lyme guidelines that had been essentially since the 60s with very minor changes. Uh, in, in the middle, 2000s, there were questions out there concerning the adequacy of these old guidelines. Uh, strip trials in central Iowa with common soybean showed little or no response to Lyme. This was uh, uh, several trials done by the, the Soybean Association on Farm Network. Uh, and then uh, with my student, master student Bianchini, we uh, did several uh, experiments in the in the in the in central Iowa, comparing uniform and variable rate, and uh, we saw the, the same things. Um, then uh, all long-term trials that were conducted by the now retired Stan Hennings and short-term trials, uh, especially done by uh, Paul Castle and Sawyer in northern Iowa, several research farms were showing very variable yield responses. Now um, the and uh, one important issue in the Iowa recommendation for Lyme, which is ages old, is that the optimum pH for uh, corn and soybean in soils with uh, soil association with calcareous subsoil is lower. It's about six than in other soil associations like in eastern Iowa or southern Iowa that don't have calcareous soils. So because of all these questions, uh, from 2007 to 2012, uh, we got funding mainly from the Iowa Soviet Association, but also the Limestone Association. And we did this 14, four year on farm trials with the main objective of uh, checking uh, if the optimum pH for corn and soybean was okay, you know, and also to check this issue of the calcareous soils, the calcareous subsoils. And then there were some questions mainly in eastern Iowa because there is a query there that has dolomitic lime. So we did some, some research about that too. So I will not into, go into much detail because there is no time. This was a great project. It was very expensive. Uh, we worked for several years because we established the experiments five in 2007, five in 2008, four in 2009, each of them four years with simple simple rate, just yes or no calcium. Because the objective, the main objective was to see what was the optimum pH, you know. And then of course we use uh, precision ag te technologies and we split those strips apart, you know, uh, with a very dense, uh, uh, about one acre grid sampling and so forth. Uh, so uh, just, of course I can show only averages this shows the, the response of corn on the left graph and soybean on the right one across all fields and years, but also across different pH within fields. So the pH range goes from less than 5 to more than 7.5, which are calcareous. Okay. So uh, there are a couple of 
interesting things in this graph. One is that, uh, of course, the the relative yield response in percent uh, decreases as the soil pH increases. That's obvious, okay, for both crops. Another important thing is that uh, most people, for some reason, believe that they should lime just for soybean or alfalfa because they are legumes and the nitrogen fixation and so forth. But this shows, you know, that uh, corn actually responds the same about the, than soybean, and uh, and actually it's more consistent. Less, less, it's less variable. The the response of corn to lime is less variable, and and this is important, you know, because given what I said in the first slide, you see the 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 major cause of uh, acidification is the nitrogen, and when the nitrogen is applied to continuous corn. Soils can acidify really fast. So people need to watch corn too. It's not just soybean that needs lime, okay? The other thing is that you can see there, those, those uh, skinny uh, lines, vertical lines, indicate the statistical significance between the, those bars. And uh, that really, the, on average, okay, for corn, the, the, the lime, uh, limine increases yield significantly when it's about five, nine, or six, or, or less than that. But uh, then there is a very little or no increase until about six, nine. Uh, and then when we have calcareous soils, actually, the application of lime can reduce yield, although this may not be significant, okay? So we see that in corn and also in soybean. See, in soybean you can see that when we have pH 7 or higher, uh, either there is no effect or there is a yield decrease. So we need to be careful in, in north central Iowa trying not to apply lime to those uh, highly calcareous spots that are common in many fields. Now, here I put uh, uh, corn and soybean together because the response was about the same, but in the left graph, uh, we put all the averages of uh, soils that had low pH subsoil, okay? And, uh, and then on the right, high pH uh, subsoil. And uh, honestly, when I started this, this, uh, this research, I never believed this issue of the, the large impact of the calcareous subsoils, because the calcareous can be down even to three feet. But I had to yield to the evidence, and the old timers were right. And actually, this was found only by George Rim in southern Minnesota, which they have soils very similar to ours in the Des Moines Low. So uh, we, we do have to apply or less lime or to maintain uh, a bit lower pH of about 6 uh, in soils that have the calcareous subsoils. Uh, you can see on the right. Uh, in this case, the, the application of lime, when the soil is, is higher than about six, the only thing that can do on average is to decrease yield. Now, another thing that, um, uh, that this large project showed uh, is I worked with lime a lot in Uruguay in the 80s uh, before I came here, and uh, mainly with alfalfa. And when I came here, I heard that people have this uh, idea that when they use a lime, you know, the lime needs three, four years in order to react in the soil completely and get the maximum pH. Uh, I was surprised because I have several trials in soils about the same as here in Uruguay, you know, and I never saw that. Always the lime got to the maximum pH in the first or the second year. And these are averages, of course, uh, but it shows precisely that. You can see the initial pH, the dash bar. Uh, then in the first year, uh, m many of the trials got the maximum pH one year after application, and then some others in the second year. But then you can see that in the third year and the fourth year, actually the pH started to decrease. So this idea that, that is out there, you know, uh, I don't know why, but, uh, and, and we use uh, a line for different queries. Uh, it's not there, so people need to be careful. Uh, ju just liming, you know, to be at six or six five, and then go to take a nap for six, seven years, because in two, three years, 
that pH, uh, that soil pH uh, will start to go down. Okay, there, I will not talk too much about this experiment about dolomitic lime, but there were some research, there have never been any here in Iowa, and uh, in, I mean, in other states, but not in Iowa. The dolomitic lime has some magnesium carbonate, usually it's about 10, 15% or, or less, and adds magnesium. But of course, there is uh, no evidence of magnesium deficiency or excess in Iowa. So, but in some in some states, you know, uh, that they may have magnesium deficiency, then uh, dolomitic lime is a is a good and uh, source of magnesium and raises pH too. Uh, the dolomitic lime dissolves uh, slightly slower than calcitic lime, so often has lower ECCE compared with calcitic lime, even with the same fineness. But on the other hand, the pure uh, uh, magnesium carbonate has a bit higher neutralizing capacity than the, than the calcium carbonates. Okay, so we did four two-year trials. We started in 2019, and the second year was 2010. This were soybean, first crop, Con rotations with field cultivation the first year of the of the lime and incorporation, not till the second year, and we had trials in central, northeast, northwest, and southwest uh, Iowa State uh, research farms. We use several rates from zero to ten tons per acre of CC, not ECC, because we really wanted to to evaluate how the ECC uh, method was measuring the effective calcium carbon, you know, in this in these two different sources, in the three sources. So we have the, the standard that is usually used for a liming trial, which is pure calcium carbonate, finely ground, calcitic lime and dolomitic lime. The dolomitic lime was from uh, um, Eastern Iowa, quarry in Eastern Iowa, and the calcitic lime was from uh, Central Iowa. Um, so we broadcast this, incorporated only before the first year soybean. And then, as I said, noted corn was planted in the second year. I cannot show uh, all, all the data for all the trials. So what I put here, uh, I'm not showing uh, the pure calcium carbonate, but I'm showing in the graph on the left, the calcitic limestone, and on the right, the dolomitic limestone effect at increasing soil pH during these two years of the trials, okay? Now, note that uh, the, there I put at the bottom of the graph, uh, I put the tons of ECCE now, okay? So you can see the ECCE applied was zero to 5.4 for calcitic lime, but only up to 3.9 for uh, the dolomitic lime because it had lower ECCE, okay? And then this graph show the pH. The interesting thing is that the lower dotted line, you know, with white squares, it shows the variation of just soil pH, you know, without liming. And this is important, you see, uh, because the, the variation in soil pH over the year due to climate or kind of things is, uh, is very high. So when one uh, uh, applies lime, you know, need to be careful, you know, uh, because the, Yes, it's important to know the initial pH, and that's what is used in order to decide uh, the, 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 if, it, if there is a need for lime or not, but it's also important to compare uh, how all the rates change over time. So as, as it's obvious, you know, the, the, the higher the rate, the higher the pH uh, for both sources, but the reason I want to show this especially is that uh, because we found exactly the same thing that in the other larger project with calcitic lime. If you look at these limes, essentially at about 200 days after application, uh, we got the highest pH. After that, you know, pH remained uh, uh, the, the same. And uh, if we had continued, the trial longer than two years, maybe it would have started to go down, as we show for the other study. Now, then the yields, you know, in spite of these differences, um, 
this, uh, there were no source differences in terms of the yield. This uh, dots, red, uh, black, you know, and blue are the different sources. And uh, uh, note that the 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 maximum rate for um, the calcitium and dolomitic line were lower than with pure calcium carbonate because what I explained that we put uh, the rates based on CC. But uh, if we had applied, it's obvious that we're more, uh, that we would have got about the same yield. So uh, the important thing is to uh, apply the lime needed to raise pH, uh, not necessarily if it is a calcitic or dolomitic lime, at least with these rates that are where people normally apply. So based on that, we finished that in 2012, uh, 2011. So we uh, we did not change the, the 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 recommendations. You see, all all the all the information uh, that we got uh, showed that the old uh, guidelines, you know, that were made up mainly in the 60s, were okay. The only thing that we did was, and some of you may remember that. Um, when uh, we have high sulfur pH for corn and soybean, even though they were saying that uh, six was the optimum pH, they suggested to increase pH to six five anyway, which I we thought you know that didn't make sense. So that was the only change that we did you know in 2013. We just have you know that uh, if the optimum pH is six, well, uh, if the soil is acidic. Uh, calculate the lime to apply to increase uh, pH to 6 or 6.5. At about alfalfa, alfalfa grass, I haven't done research with glass clover mixtures or alfalfa here, uh, but that pH 6.9 is used by all the states in the north central region. I have the suspicion that uh, it's too high. Uh, if I were a farmer, I wouldn't increase pH so high maybe six, seven, six, eight, but, but anyway, because I don't have the research, uh, we just leave the, the guidelines like that. The other thing we did in 2013 is we put uh, the equations so people can, uh, for variable rate, can use the equations uh, if they want to apply uh, using variable rate. Okay, uh, back in the 2013, 14, there were many questions started to come up about pelleted lime, mainly because there was a, a, a company, Calcium Products, that they um, manufactured pelleted lime from quarries in northern Iowa, near uh, Fort Dodge and Gilmore City. So um, the issues with the pelleted lime is that uh, there was no research in Iowa that we knew of. And the research uh, somewhere else was really scarce and uh, not very good, not very information, and they're very variable. There were some uh, experiments in Ohio, I think in Illinois and other states, but uh, some were just one year, maybe they don't have enough replication. And then some show that the peloton line was really bad, but others was the same as our line. So we decided to, um, to have some some trials, and we had two two projects that were conducted about the same time. One was an incubation uh, that was the thesis of uh, now Dr. John Jones. He's in Wisconsin. Um, the we had three Iowa acidic soils, a sandy soil from the near the Mississippi uh, River, uh, Nicolet Loam, Amahaska. Uh, we have eight incubation times. We incubated that with the amounts of the three soils from seven to 210 days. And then we use the standard or reference of uh, finally ground uh, calcium carbonate, the calcitic lime, uh, the dolomitic lime from, from Eastern Iowa, and then pelleted lime from these uh, queries that I mentioned. And for the incubation, we just use a single rate, okay? that it was equivalent to eight tons of CCE, not ECC, um, uh, for, for, for this experiment. Now, uh, this, the sources uh, 
Uh, the CCE and the ECCE is there, the calcitic line, 95% CCE and 59% uh, ECCE. The dolomitic lime had 15% magnesium, and um, and then uh, the the CC was 100%. Remember what I said about the magnesium carbonate having higher neutralizing power than the the, magnesium, the calcium carbonate. But then the the ECC was 65%, which in this case was was a bit better than the the, the calcitic lime. And then the pellet the lime. That was uh, the questions about pellet and lime was not just the um, the efficiency in the field because of the granules, but also if the measurement of the ECCE was really a good one. And this is something that we worked together with uh, Stan Henning and uh, John Sawyer. We worked with idols, um, and uh, the before we started this experiment. Uh, the method that uh, idols propose is a wet sieving uh, method. See, in other states, they do a dry sieving method. So I believe that because this is a wet sieving method, uh, that probably the granules was not a problem, okay? But we, we just follow the method exactly the same as we did for calcitic lime and the dolomitic lime. So here I just put as an example of how Iowa uh, calcitic ag lime. And here I put the uh, John sieve this in different, different uh, through different screens. So I have at the top the cores uh, passing uh, mesh four, the twenty, etc., up to a very fine, and uh, and I put in yellow those that are required by uh, idols here, which is the four mesh, the eight, and the sixty mesh. As I said, in a couple of other states, they also include the 20 mesh, but uh, seldom the 100 mesh is, is used. Now, this is the pellet of lime that we use. Um, one problem that uh, we had when looking at the literature for pellet of lime is there is very little information about what limestone is used, especially the fineness, before making the granules before pelletizing, you see. There is just no information at all. So the good thing with this uh, pelleted lime, and this information is, you know, calcium product has it, you know, I believe it's in the, in the, in the website, um, is they really uh, uh, ground very fine the limestone before pelletizing it. So I put there on the on, on the left, 100% past March 30, 99% past March 60, 75% March 100, and even 60%, more than half, past mesh 200. And then the granules are that size, that's what we used. Of course, the uh, granulated agent is, is used. Uh, so this is important because, uh, as I said, uh, for other pelleted lime, we, in, at, at least in the in, in the literature in the papers, they do not include how in the world it was made from 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 what. Okay, in the incubation study we did all kind of things, but I'm just showing the averages across the soils. We can see there that uh, in the in the graph of the left, we have soil pH, and then below in the x-axis is the uh, the incubation time. Okay. Uh, from essentially nothing initial to 210 days. So look at the control. In this case, it was a control uh, experiment uh, in, in, in the lab, so there was no essentially change of the pH of the control. And then you can see the different color lines and points that the dolomitic lime had the, the, the lowest um, uh, effect on the, on, on the pH. Um, and remember that the rate was all the same in terms of e CC, okay, not ECC. Uh, then came the calcitic lime, then the pelleted lime, and then finally the calcium carbonate. I was really surprised by this, these results. And, uh, but we have four replications. Uh, they was consistent because I never expected, especially in a, 
in an incubation study that we did not break the, the granules, which was mixed with the soil, um, how, how the pellet and lime was actually uh, even better than the calcitic lime and the lomitic lime, and very close to the calcium carbonate, which is the standard, very fine uh, and pure calcium carbonate. So on the, in, in the bar graphs at, at the right, you see, I just calculated, if you look at those numbers, we see that by the 175 days, uh, the, the curves were flat. So I just averaged, averaged the last two incubation dates. So you can see there, uh, in terms of the efficiency, uh, compared with uh, calcium carbonate of the different sources. So the pellet in line was uh, higher than 80%, about 90%. The dolomitic lime was a bit higher than 40%, and the calcitic lime about 60%. So, of course, this is in the, in, the, in the lab. So we also have these experiments at the field. We uh, use the same methodology that I described for the dolomitic lime trials. So we have six now, uh, two-year field trials. We started with, with, with corn. And then the second year was soybean. And we have uh, two soils in central Iowa. That was in a clarion, uh, the other in a Nicolet. Um, in eastern Iowa, in that sandy soil, in northwest Iowa, southeast Iowa, and southwest Iowa. Now, all, all were acidic. And then uh, we compared the pure calcium carbonate, finally ground again, the standard, the uh, calcitic and lime and pellet and lime. We did not include the dolomitic lime in this study. Now, the sources were the same, that uh, the, the, the CCE and ECCE, as I mentioned before, and the rates that we applied in the field were 0, 2, 4, and 8 tons per acre of CCE, okay? Uh, we apply in the, all the sources broadcast in the fall of 2014, before corn in 2015, and we incorporated the sources by uh, some light disking. And then for the second year soybean, we did not reapply, okay? And, uh, and then we planted uh, no-till soybean. Okay, these are the, the, the effects of the three sources on pH, okay? So in the graph of the, at the left, we have the ag line. And then uh, in the x-axis, we have the, the, the time. Okay, in the field, we were up to almost two years. We we took soil samples of those uh, in in the spring after the first application, about four or five months after application. And then in June, and then two three times until the end of the next year. So uh, in the in the graph in the center is the pure calcium carbonate, and uh, in the graph at the right is the pelleted line. Uh, we actually got results that uh, the pellet and lime was even better than the, what we found in the incubation. Uh, we were really surprised, uh, but this is, this is what we got. So uh, you can see that those blue numbers is the ECC rate that we applied uh, for each, with each product. 4.9 was the maximum with a lime, 8 was with the uh, uh, calcium carbonate, and about 7.9 because the ECC was very high, almost the same as the pure calcium carbonate for the pelleted line. So we see again in the, uh, the dashed line at the bottom, that's a zero, the high variation of the soil pH without applying lime. And then we see that, of course, as the rate increased, we increased pH. Um, two things. Uh, uh, to know there is that exactly the same as all the trials that we've done here in Iowa with different materials, uh, you can see that by the 12 months or about one year, uh, all sources have reached the, the, the highest pH. So again, I have no clue where that idea that you need two, three, four years for the lime to react to increase pH because we did not observe in any trial that, that we have done. And, um, and then there is a short plateau, and they start to go down, essentially immediately. Um, 
Okay, so uh, again, we see that the pellete lime is essentially all, it's almost exactly the same as if it were pure, finely ground calcium carbonate. So it is really a, a good product. Now, when we look at the yields, and I have here the average across sites, corn in the left graph and soybean, second year soybean in the, in the right. Remember, we applied those rates only uh, once before the corn. And in this case, I put the, the, the rates as ECCE, okay? Uh, that's the reason that the red dots for ag lime don't go all the way, you know, to eight, you know? But um, again, happened like we observed with the, in, in the calcitic and dolomitic lime trials, that it doesn't make any difference. That uh, as long as we apply the lime source uh, according to ECCE to raise pH, you know, uh, there's no difference between sources. Now, an important issue here is that if you look at that, the lowest rate that we applied was about one ton of ECCE. So some people, um, and, and of course, Calcium Product was asking me, well, what, what would have happened if, if you had a uh, use lower rates. I said, well, given the, the way the curves are, you know, I don't think there will be much, much of a difference. But uh, anyway, so, okay. So in summary, what we found was that the pellet lime, uh, contrary to all expectations from my side, at least, was similar to the standard, which is finally ground calcium carbon that increased pH. Um, it increased pH faster than, than uh, a lime, uh, by 4.5 months after application. See, when we applied in the fall and then we measured um, soil pH in late March or early April, uh, we saw that by then, by that time, yes, the, the, um, the pellet lime and the calcium carbonate increased pH to a bit higher level. But when we measured um, after, the, after one year, you know, it was all the same. And all sources have reached a maximum pH of 6.5 in, in all soils. And then we saw no yield difference. So the conclusion from this is that uh, applying the lime source with cheapest, that is cheapest by pound of ECC put at the field is the most cost-effective way of managing pH. Uh, the lower rate applied was one ton per acre, so uh, Still, the yield increases uh, did, not, did not suggest that there would be any difference with lower rates. But we did not evaluate that, okay? We did not include low, very low rates in that study. So in 2020, we started a new research designed specifically to evaluate the effect of uh, low rates, apply either uh, only once in the first year before corn, or twice reapplied for soybean in the second year. It was the same, exactly the same uh, methodology, six years. We did not include a line, we did not include calcium carbonate because we have plenty of data showing that the pellet line was essentially the same as pure calcium carbonate, okay? So those are the rates that we applied from the lowest was uh, 100 pounds of the pellet line. The characteristics were the same as the, the what, what we used before. And the high was 6,400 pounds because I wanted to have a, a, at least a high rate that for sure would increase the pH to at least 6,5. Um, I'm showing here just one graph, which is kind of complicated, average across sites, the effects of the pellet and lime rates on soil pH, okay? So uh, we applied in October 2019 and then took soil samples several times and the last was in October 2021. So until March 2021, the the the, the second year, uh, we measure uh, the the uh, the effect of the initial rates, and then after that, the effect of the annual rates. So all these black lines, okay, are the effect of the initial rates. That, that we applied. So you have zero, uh, look at the variability of the control, uh, this huge, 
100, 200, 400, 100, 1600, and 6400, okay? Uh, we reach about pH 6.5 only with the 6400 rate, uh, but the 600 single initial increased pH to about 5, uh, 8 to 6, okay? And what we see here is that really, uh, if you compare not pH with the initial, but you compare pH with the control because of the variability over time, see that the 100, 200, and 400 rates practically did not increase pH too much. It was, the increase was less than 0.3. And by the way, the low peak of pH in June 2020, that was probably the effect of the nitrogen applied to core in the spring that acidified, okay? Then, in the fall of 2020, we applied uh, nothing to half of the plots, and the other half, we reapplied the same rate that we had put in the first year. Now, note that for the high rate, we did not apply, again, 6,400 pounds, because I thought it would be too much, so we applied only 1,600 pounds. And then, uh, yes, this... Uh, two-year application, annual application of the 800, 1600, or the other one with the 1600 on the first year, 6400, increased pH a bit, but the rates of 400 or lower uh, did not did not change pH much com in comparison with the control. Now, this is a complicated graph. Uh, but shows we have responses in all six sites to corn. This is first year corn, okay? And we have the initial rates, and this is grain yield, bushel per acre, and you see that there was a, the typical uh, yield increases with decreases increments to a high plateau. Uh, in most sites, there wasn't much difference between the, the 1600 rate and the 6400 rate, but in a couple of sites, it was a big difference, like in, a, in, in the boom side, in the northeast uh, um, farm and the southwest farm. Um, the other interesting things that are here again, I yield to the evidence. I remember discussing with the company when we talk about the, these trials that I thought, listen, this using 100, 200, 400 pounds per acre, you know, that's ridiculous. You know, that's not going to change pH, it will not change yield. Well. It did not change yield much, but uh, it did increase yield a little bit. Now, it was just a few bushels. Uh, of course, the, the, there were large yield losses, unless the 1,600 or the 6,400 pounds um, was applied. Remember that uh, the 6,400, we got pH 6.5 or higher, and the 1,600 got to pH between 5.8 and 6 and the increase for the other rates was uh, very small in pH. This is the second year. It gets more complicated because, of course, we have the effect of the residual rates. That's the red. See, we apply in the first year and did not reapply for the second year soybean. And then the blue line, some points, that's when we reapply those rates, okay? And, uh, and what we see here is that uh, essentially in the second year, for three of the sites, there wasn't much difference between the residual effects uh, and, the, and the annually applied rates for actually for all, for no, for all the rates. It was about the same in Ames, Boone, and in the Northwest Farm. But in the Northeast Farm, uh, the Southeast Farm, and the Southwest Farm, uh, there was uh, an effect of the low applications applied annually. That make, make, made sense, okay? You can see that with application, the about 1,600 pounds or less, then uh, applying that twice for the first year gone and again for, for corn, for soybean, increase, increase the, the pH. Um, now, on average, this is average across all the sites. I put on the, on the left the curve for, for corn. Remember the initial? apply rates for corn. And then on the right, we have the residual effect of the single initial rates and also the uh, annually applied rates. So the, a couple of things important. On corn, even the 1,600 
rate, you know, uh, resulted in some lower yield, about five, six bushels lower. And you can see that in the right, in the left graph. But then for the, for soybean, um, th that rate, you know, yeah, uh, was a bit lower, the, 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 the red line, you know, uh, but it wasn't that many, just about a couple of bushels less than the 6,400. And the 6,400 initial uh, reached the maximum, which was the same as applying the 8,000 pounds, you know, in, in the annual applications. And then we see that uh, the with the annual applications of, of uh, 800 pounds, Okay, 800 pounds each year and 1,600 pounds each year, uh, we essentially got almost the, the maximum yield. Okay, just with the 800, we got about two, three bushels less, but the other rates, uh, 400 or less applied uh, only once or annually, uh, got lower, lower yields. Okay, so it's interesting to look at what happened across the both crops. So in order to do that, we need to use relative yield increases because you cannot add the yield of corn and soybean, of course. So this shows, you know, the percent increase for corn and soybean only when the initial rates were applied. That's the rate, the red points and the red line, okay? And the blue points and the blue line shows when we apply the, of course, the initial rates for the corn, and then we reapply the rates for soybean. So, uh, my conclusion from this is that there is no magic. If uh, you apply very low rates, uh, there is a yield loss. And uh, in order to maximize the yield of the two crops, you need to apply either the 1,600 pounds uh, twice each year or uh, apply the higher rate of 6,400 pounds, which increase pH to 6,5. In summary then, uh, we use uh, pellet land rates of 100 to 6,400, an initial rate of 6,400 increase pH to 6,5 to 6,7 and maximize yield of first year corn and also the yield of the second year soy. An initial rate of 1,600, much less than the highest rate, increased pH only to 5.8 to 6.1. Corn yield was about, the first year was about five bushels lower, but the second year soybean yield was almost similar to the maximum yield with or without reapplication. Uh, single initial rates of 800 pounds of less increased pH very little and seriously limited yield of first year corn and also second year soybean. Um, replication of the 800 pounds for the second year increased pH to about 5.8, you know. And this was not, did not reach the maximum yield, but it was, it was close. So the bottom line, don't underestimate the effects of low pH at decreasing crop yield. Uh, soil should, for corn and soybean should be at least six, and in these areas of Eastern Iowa and Southern Iowa should be 6.5. Uh, recent research confirmed those those uh, optimal rates that, that we have. Um, applying the cheapest lime source per pound of ECC put at the field is the most cost-effective way of managing soil pH and lime. Okay, um, pellet lime was a very good product, essentially similar to pure finely ground calcium carbonate, but it's more expensive. Uh, by pound of ECC, and as uh, the data show, uh, the the yield is essentially the same, you know. And uh, now, we did not apply extremely low rates of ag lime in these trials. We couldn't afford it. So, if somebody for some reason wants to apply 200, 400, 800 pounds of lime only, which most likely will limit the yield. Um, then perhaps pellet lime is a better source than ag lime because it allows for a more uniform application. Uh, all of us have seen when uh, finally ground ag lime is applied with wind, you know, who knows where the lime is going. So with the um, granulation, you know, uh, most likely uh, the application is more 
So then could be more efficient at a very low rate of uh, agli. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can contact me at that phone number and that email address. And some of all this information is in our soil fertility website. Thank you. Mm -hmm.